been a while. Uh, do we have Xi listening in today? Yes, yeah, Xi Jinping's in. We had Porter in. Uh, we got a few people in. So uh, I, I, I'll sit for. I won't. It won't be that long, but I'll sit for a while because I got to take a break and a. I got to digest all the bullshit that I just heard from. Uh, oh my god. That's all I can say is, oh my God. The European debt markets are, are unbelievably greater. Gold went up. Yeah, because you see what's going on here? They First, all the European debt market. So it must be that the ECB is in buying because this reversal, look at the bonds were down. I'm talking about futures. They were down 130 ticks or down, down 11. And this all happened since the end of her conference, by the way. Oh, yeah. So they're intervening. Big There's time. no question that they can. No. Yeah. And, and, and right at that same moment when she was done at 830, the yep. S&P's picked up, the Dow picked yep. up. So it's yep. all the same trade. Yep. That's right, Judd. Absolutely right. It's unbelievable. And she, I mean, she made some comments. They're going to come back. One she called this, and I don't know whether anybody listened to it. All right, Michael, I forget it. Let's go to China. I'll talk about this stuff later. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm all good. I'm, I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, you hey, know, we... hey, I, I, got a, I got a question maybe for Michael that, he, that might kind of opens up some other stuff, but. Okay. Michael, uh, so, you know, this is Pete, Peter in uh, Philadelphia. And, uh, um, you know, the, uh, Xi has like really stepped up the party's control of so many things, including the, you know, the uh, all kinds of economic interventions. I want to go to the crypto thing. Why? Why did he? What, what were they trying to accomplish by banning mining and Bitcoin? And and what do you think is going to be the consequence for that? Of that for them? Oh yeah, I've been uh, I've been thinking about this uh, lately too. Uh, so. The uh, one of the main functionality of Bitcoin or cryptos in China is to uh, allow uh, capital to flow out somewhat freely. Yeah, it's in it's a medium of you know ex foreign exchange uh, because they have the um, the foreign exchange restrictions on China's uh, Chinese citizens. Uh, they can only do fifty fifty thousand. Uh, U.S. dollars per year. Uh, that's um, that's on the law side, but in pra but in practice, um, very few people can 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 uh, get fifty U.S. Uh, U uh, fifty thousand U.S. dollars per year uh, to uh, meet meet their um, uh, whatever investing or uh, foreign home buying um, demands. So um, they've been doing this for a while. So uh, many Chinese citizens turn to Bitcoin or other forms of crypto to facilitate the, uh, this uh, foreign exchange functionality. So they're banning uh, Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining uh, to curb uh, the, the outflow of the uh, state capital. That, that's, I think that's the, one of the main reasons why they're doing it. Uh, and some other reasons are um, trying to keep the um, the RMB firm, I guess, <laughs> because uh, if you can exchange Bitcoin for USDT, which is you know staple coin for US dollars, um, uh, the more they sell uh, RMB, uh, well, the, the the more RMB will drop. Uh, against the dollar, so I guess that's another reason why they wanted to uh, curb the Bitcoin trading and Bitcoin mining activity, and the uh, electricity requirement for Bitcoin mining also is a challenge for uh, China's out nowadays because they they uh, they cannot generate enough electricity. <laughs> uh well to uh to meet the uh the demand well yeah. one thing one thing i've uh contem contemplated was 
uh, why the uh, the lack of electricity was so prominent this year is that I think they might have turned on uh, some new newly built high power radar uh, network uh, uh. In, in China. I think that's why, because uh, the lack of electricity happened. Uh, those cities were impacted the most uh, was the northern part of China, which is uh, you know really close to Japan and Russia, that region, and well, yeah. uh, North Korea too. So that region was impacted the most, and that region has a really big military uh, well uh, base right there. So I guess. I contemplated the idea, so uh, I'm I I don't I'm not sure if that's true or not, <laughs> but I think they have turned <laughs> on some huge radar networks over there. Oh wow! So so do you think there's a uh, you know take let's say they taken China out of the crypto game, the Bitcoin game? I don't know if that's really the case or because in the past they've. Yeah clip down and it didn't happen, but maybe it has happened this time. Is there, do you think that's going to hurt them somehow or is that, it doesn't matter? Because uh, it seems like his, his interventions in, in the capitalism and markets, the market economy direction and is, is going to be consequential to me, but uh, what do you think? Uh, hurt crypto or hurt China? China's, China's uh, banning of crypto. I mean, is, is it is it uh, gonna? Is it gonna have a financial effect on them in the future? Is it gonna take them out of the crypto game for real? Or, oh uh, well, I I don't think so. Because well, let's let's put it this way: China is people are, people is are the gonna second. Get around it. Yeah, China is the second biggest economy. So even if there's a consequence, they can kick the can down the road for a very very long time. Okay. That that's my take on. It. Okay. So, are they uh, you know, like what's going on what, what do, you, do you have any insight what's going on in capital markets, you know, there with, you know, them you know, foreign like foreign investment is is being discouraged in a lot of ways now that it wasn't before and also then there's the whole problem with the with uh, the Evergrande and the whole property sector, uh, you know, all the bad debt and the over the overcapacity they've built in uh, apartments. You see anything going on with that? Uh, yeah, I've been following the uh, the Evergrande fiasco. Um, that's just a, a tip of the iceberg. I mean, it's on the news because they want it to be on the news. They want to pressure uh, the president of Evergrande, uh, that, that's all, it's all political. Uh, yeah. If they don't want it to be on the news, you won't even know about it. That, that's simple as that. Yeah. Uh, so it's political, it's a show. Uh, I, I don't think there's any real consequences gonna uh, come out of this. The Chinese uh, government, central government will just uh, take away his assets and his money and pay off the debt. That's all. <laughs> um, but in regards to your comment about China, China is closing uh, his, uh, its, uh, its capital markets to foreign investors. I, I don't think that's true because look at Larry no, Fink. Well, I think they've, they've, <laughs> look at I'm, I'm not saying they closed it, but I think they've you know they've they've done a lot of things which which should dissuade you know cap foreign investors from going in there like you know like they were the first ones that, to eat the defaults at Evergrande for instance. Well, you know, they will like they will certainly dis dissuade uh, some smaller funds from going into China to invest. However, uh, to those whom are useful to the state. And you know, uh, Chinese, uh, they they will be granted a lot of freedom in what they can do. Uh, Larry Fink, for example, uh, BlackRock, they've been partnering with uh, 
China State, uh, I think it's the Development Fund, uh, City Development Fund. So, uh, well, he, he could make a ton of money from that, <laughs> selling, uh -huh. selling those bonds. Yeah. So it, so it really depends who you are and what you can do for the, uh, the, the Chinese, the, the high up officials. Can you, launch, can you launch your money for them? You know, can you um, get their kids into Harvard or something? <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> it really depends so, who you are. So, so like you know, because I'm sure you thought about Alibaba, what you know, the merits of that. You know, that with it's down so much. I mean, what do you think the pros and cons are at this point with for Alibaba with this scenario? Well, it's a, it's a. Um, my take is it's an. It's not a popular opinion, but I think Alibaba is it's a buy at these levels. I mean, it is still making money. So don't get this wrong. It's still the largest online retailer in China and it's still the highest volume e-payment processor in China. It's still making money. So uh, I, I don't see how the Chinese crackdown or so-called crackdown can affect uh, Alibaba's business is still running. It's they just take it away from uh, Jack Ma. That's all. They don't want it to be held by a private citizen. They want it to be in control of the state, and that's what they're doing, and that's what will be done. But in the end, at the end of the day, it's still the biggest company in China. It's still making money. That's all I care. And it's a global company too. Well, the global side of things, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, how, well, let's say uh, Alipay, the uh, the most prominent business uh, within the Alibaba group, is not really penetrating the walls of Visa and Master um, in the, the Western countries. However, in other third world countries like Africa, um, well, countries of uh, the Africa, and then uh, some European, East European countries, they use Alipay. Um, they have successfully gained the market share over there. So um, maybe it's just, um, it's just like Cold War, you know, um, the coalition against uh, Russia or, or Soviet Union, <laughs> you know? So uh, let, let me ask you, let's change tack a little bit to get off the singular company thing. I mean, you know, we've seen this big military buildup, right? And I yeah. wanted to get your take on, you know, there's supposed Sputnik thing, you know, the buildup and, and the incursion uh, across the strait. Um, you know, they've got obviously uh, all the magnesium in the world. So that's you know, that's had a big impact over the last few months on, on aluminum prices worldwide and the aluminum names. Uh, what, what, what are you seeing in, in, in that realm, Michael? Um, I don't know about aluminum. However, uh, for the past few years, rare earth uh, export uh, has been restricted and that caused some trouble. Uh, something like um i think lithium li lithium too uh they they curb exports on lithium even mining uh for lithium citing environmental reasons <laughs> but we all know that's bullshit um <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh the the outcome of that i think is um they just want more money for their resources. They're not unwilling to export them. They just want more money out of it. Oh, uh, you think they're gonna trade that to the West for other products or? Yes, yes. So we all know there's a, uh, there's a chip uh, export ban uh, for, for China here in, in the United States. So I guess what they're doing is, okay, we want our chips, but if you want your uh, magnesium, aluminum, lithium, things like that, sell us those chips 
and we can sell you these resources. So, yeah, I, I think that's what's ultimately what's going to happen. Biden will make a deal. Um, well, the, the U.S. trade representative will, will make a deal. Well, all things, all things considered, I don't think this will escalate to um, um, war. I think it's just um, yelling, yelling at each other on you know two ends of the table. It's just uh, part of the game. <laughs> it's all political stunt. Can I ask a couple of questions before I? Uh... Oh, yeah, sure. Sure. Okay. So, Michael, so you tell, you talked about uh, with Bitcoin, the or crypto. Let's just make it more generic. Crypto that it was to prevent some uh, uh, potential outflow of yuan and therefore downward pressure on the yuan. So, why do you think that they want to hold yuan? Uh, valuation to a higher level, because that certainly flies in the face, right, of what the Chinese model has been, which is uh, no matter what goes on, we're gonna export, export, export. And if the currency is desired to be hold, to be held at a higher level, why, why do you think that that has now become a policy, uh, a, a desire for, for policy outcome? Um, I think it's, uh, well, I looked at the, uh, the economic data, the average debt of each uh, Chinese citizen, uh, the mm -hmm. component of the debt is mainly real estate. So if the Chinese, Ch Chinese dollar, uh, well, the, the, uh, the IMB isn't firm enough, uh, a lot of their debts uh, what, how, how do you call it? Uh, their, their property value or well, their uh, the house. I think the housing price will fall dramatically. Dramatically. If, and if the dollar were to rise, right? Yes, yes. Okay. I think that's the main reason why they want to keep a firm uh, RMB. Oh, okay. Is to um, uh, well to to compact to to compact the. Uh, deflationary force they are putting on their uh, property markets. Okay. Uh, so, okay. But if, uh, all right. Now, so when you, we were talking, I know Judd wants to get away from the individual firms. But when That's I, okay. Go ahead. When, when, I, when I looked, when I, yeah. I actually yeah. bought some on the uh, severe breaks, asking your view on this, like on DD. Uh, What's the symbol? When I read what they were doing, they were just, it's not that Didi couldn't operate. It's just that they hated that Didi and some of the other techs were gathering as much data as the, uh, as the CCP has uh, historically wanted to gather and they hated the competition. So they sent their messages to, well, you can make money, but the data gathering is, you're, you're stepping on some... Um, you're stepping. You're potentially stepping over a very dangerous line. Uh, is you, could you see that in any way like that? That's true. That's true. That's really true. Um, because uh, I I discussed with my friends the other day uh, why they they want um, they want Didi to um, come back to Chinese markets instead of on on the Western foreign markets. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's because the data that DD has is very, very variable. You see, um, well, I, I, I can't draw or show you a drawing of uh, the Chinese Ch Ch China China's map, but um, ninety five percent of the China population lives within uh, two hundred miles within the coast. Uh, the the uh, whether to be southern coast or eastern or northern coast, ninety five percent of what, China. How much? Ninety five percent of Is the that China. Right? Yeah, wow. lives within five hundred miles from the coast. So it's as uh, if you look at China's map, 
that will look like a strip extending from the uh, the south to the north. So what DV has is the traffic data, right? Mm -hmm. So the, how, how the traffic flows between each cities or within a city. Uh, imagine at the time of war, what, um, how do you get um, uh, supplies? Let's say the war is fought um, um, at the Taiwan Strait. So how, how do you get resources from one place to another, right? Where are the choke points, mm. right? So at the time of war, can US military use this information to destroy, uh, strate uh, strategically, to destroy some choke points to um, cut off this supply line, wow. yeah. right? It's very sensitive. It's so sensitive that the Chinese government can use this, um, well, let's say extreme measure to uh, crack down on DD's data gathering. Wow, but, so, so that's, so, so they can operate. So, so it's just the data that, and, and who's going where all the time, right? It's just like if I had all the yep. news and, and yep. uh, wow, okay. So actually you make the case why I should actually be buying DD if you can buy it low enough, because it's yeah. not, they won't be allowed to make money. It's just that they won't be allowed to be able to, what they're going to do with their data. Yep. And it's lining up with K-Web too. So you want to buy it in the low sevens, it's trying to come down there, mid to high, mid sevens. Uh, that's, that's great. That's what, Michael, that's, see, you know, you can think what you want, but I love always talking to you because you have such a good perspective. You know, I'm not sure about, uh, I, I know it, and you're, you're honest enough in your analysis, like on the radar uh, that they're up in, it's it's you you uh, openly say that's very speculative. I mean, it could be, it could you know, yeah, but there is definitely a sea change in the amount in the way that China is using energy, right? Yeah. Because over the past year, think about think about it. It's COVID, right? It's yeah. COVID, and the factories were down for months, and they are not even fully operating right now. So <laughs> where are the electricities going? Right. And they cracked down on Bitcoin. And to say the least, Bitcoin mining aren't even um, prominent presence of uh, energy usage in those uh, most affected uh, regions. Hmm. And those regions similarly have a large military presence. So, well, that that's my that's that's my my take on the explanation how they're using those electricity is to you know open up or uh, bring those radar online. Uh, that that <laughs> that's all I can think of. Hmm. Hmm. I I mean, really, this is so good, and you know, but well, let me let me ask you something. In like today again, the Biden administration, which is all over the place in so many ways, again, not a political statement, just a, a fact. <laughs> uh, well, it's a, it's it, it's an it's it's an uh, enlightened observation. <laughs> I, fact, you know, it's hard to discern facts whenever you're in this realm. Um, but here they go talking about Taiwan again, Taiwan again, Taiwan again, and moving them into more international organizations. That was the other day with, with uh, Blinken. You know, it, it's just, is there anything to be gained from uh, them elevating the, uh, uh, the, the pressure? I guess that's the best word. Uh, um, well, I... So let's put it this way. I look at this 
as a uh, political political stunt. Um, they they want to act or pretend to be uh, hard on China. Mm-hmm. However, as we all know, um, we can't live without China. It, uh, well, it's a it's a hard fact. So we can't live without China. We can't live without uh, the Chinese manufacturing complex, right? So uh, we 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 can see these um, signs that decoupling with China can cause uh, so many issues that issues cannot be solved in a sh- short amount of time. Um, so uh, let's look at this. Um, so uh, I looked at the data the other day, uh, United States imports and the China exports, right? What, what is the United States buying from China? Um, well, uh, everyday goods, um, your clothes, shoes, stuff like that. And these are what affects uh, ordinary US citizens daily life, right? Uh, if you decouple with China, you, if you can't get the, um, the manufacturing costs down, American citizens will feel it. They will feel it immediately. Um, well, how, how come I can buy a shirt for $20 last month and this month I have to pay 40? Oh, because it's made in USA, <laughs> right? <laughs> They're gonna feel it. And I don't think Biden ad- ad- administration want the inflation to be um, at these levels. They wanna keep the, uh, the, the consumer prices down. So in order to do this, we cannot irritate China. Uh, we, we cannot decouple with China. That's my take on it. So everything they said, uh, I think it's just for foreign policy, um, political stunt to gain some leverage mm-hmm. on Xi, I guess. <laughs> and there, there, there is a really good reason why the US will trying to defend Taiwan's in, independence because of the uh, semiconductor uh, industry over there. We all know uh, we rely heavily on uh, TSMC's fabrication plants to manufacture chips. And, um, but I think over time, uh, if the US government can bring enough um, semi-production over here within the, um, the United States, uh, Taiwan's strategic importance will diminish over time, I mean. But, uh, well, that production rate has to be built up over, I say, 10 years to be where we are right now. So TSMC is investing three plants in, uh, I think it's in uh, Arizona, three plants in Texas. Yeah, I'm down here in Arizona, believe me, big impact. And there's another one coming. Yeah, and I think the government is granting Intel some money to open up, uh, well, three more plants as well. So they wanted to bring the semi-production over here in the United States to mm. <clears throat> to guarantee the supplies of chips. And then, uh, well, Taiwan's strategic importance will just diminish. They cannot let Taiwan fall into the Chinese hands for now, for now, I mean. So they have to drag it. They have to drag it down the road. Um, so if China is there to um, show their force, uh, U.S. will step up their game, but I don't think this will escalate to war because both China and the U.S. know they cannot live without each other. And if there's a war to be fought, both sides will be losers. There will be no winners in this war. 
I think that I think that's very very well said. I think you're right on target there. Uh, no, it, it, it's it's good. It's always good to, to talk because this is you know they they like to escalate it. The escalation is stupid. It's again, you have to look at what the bottom line is. You you're not you're not going to risk what needs to be risked. And and you know what? If China see, understands that Taiwan is going to be weakened by moving. Uh, the uh, semiconductor chip um, manufacturing away from Taiwan. Well, that I don't, they're not, China has not been interested in Taiwan because of the semiconductor industry. You know, we, we, that's, that just happened along the way. Um, so that's not what the interest is. And, it, and if China really doesn't, and, and, and I don't know that they want, I, Wow. You know, I can read one thing and I can read many people who I respect who they don't want confrontation. They, they want to let it know that this issue is not going to go away, right? That it was never going to go away. We learned that in 1971 when Kissinger and uh, Joe and Lai first. I would, I would throw one thing into that. I mean, that's, that's an, you know, I think that's kind of an economic argument. And the other thing is that at least the way the U.S. is being run these days, it's in decline, and its ability to project power across the Pacific is would be in decline too. Uh, but if uh, China has its way with Taiwan, it's strategically it's say goodbye to Japan and South Korea and Vietnam, and I mean the whole that whole that whole region is not going to be stay in the U.S. orbit. Well, yeah, that's the that I think that's the importance of. China. Uh, why the Chinese wants to uh, occupy or reunite with Taiwan is to drive away the U.S. influence in that region, in the Pacific region, because Taiwan right there, it's only two, it's only two hundred uh, hundred something miles from um, many of the um, the China China's richest cities along the coast. So yeah. having a U.S. military base right there, it's a thorn in, in your throat, so to speak. But, it, but it's also a part of Japan's security, too, is the South China Sea. Being yeah, a, it's a stabilizing power over there to combat, yeah. you know, uh, the, the Chinese influence in that region. Yeah. With, with, with a very sordid colonial history in many ways. So... I mean, there, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of issues at play here, and who's to say that what China does that you know you have to make the assumption that they this is for nefarious purposes. Well, I don't know. Um, yeah, by and who am I to say uh, what's nefarious, what's not nefarious? But is China re, trying to rebalance the world order in in favor of China? Absolutely. But so is everybody else. Yeah. So so is Russia. That's right. Uh, it, yeah. It, absolutely. And 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 your nefariousness is is my uh, you know again. Uh, how how do you want to see the world? China says I'm just you know correcting past imbalances that have absolutely done the world terrible terrible things. How many wars? And I'm not interested in that. I'm just trying to. Yeah, there's been a Chinese empire, of course, historically. Um, were they a force for good or were they a force for bad? You know, anybody in the American realm says we've been a force for good. And relative, and again, it's all relative, relative to the world's uh, history of empires. I think the U.S. actions have been better than most empires that we've ever seen through the the uh, the rampages of history, but you know the, this is going to be played out, and you can stake out whatever uh, role you wish or position you wish. Uh, and the one thing, the one great advantage that China has is that their view of time is far different than the West view of time, which is yeah. a linear. The Chinese will. 
you know, I, again, always that conversation between Kissinger and Joe and Lai uh, about time and the way that they see time. I, I, I'm always a, intrigued by that, but that's, but that's still the way it plays out. So where, where we get bent out of shape on a daily basis, the Chinese will go, you know, I got 30, 40, 50 years. It, it's interesting because we, in the way that we read this, it's always with time, again, is immediately, except when it comes to looking at uh, uh, green investments. You know, like I, I, Jeffrey Sachs, who I have no uh, respect for whatsoever, I have many reasons why, you know, comes out, well, by 2050. 2050, that's 30 years. You know how many, <laughs> you know, that we'll be at this level. I have no idea. But before, so again, we, we have timelines and in foreign policy, of course, time is immediate. And that's the way that we wanna see things play out. But there was an interesting piece written, Michael, and then I'm gonna leave after this, by um, Ambrose Evans Pritchard, who is one of my favorite global macro journalists. But he was talking about that if you really look at, uh, and he wrote it yesterday, so if you can go find it in the Telegraph, uh, Xi Jinping history of uh, being uh, gr uh, quote unquote green is actually has longevity because he was before he uh, rose to power as the uh, as the uh, chairman of the uh, of the CCP and the head of and the head of China he was actually running into uh, uh, a lot of uh, arguments because he was trying to move China into a much less carbon intensive uh, environment prior to his rise. And so that uh, um, Ambrose Evans Pritchard's comment was that China could be a much more positive, that they could surprise at the, you know, COVID, uh, at the uh, Glasgow conference that starts on uh, Sunday, you know, the COP26 that everybody's talking about, and you might get more out of China, even though he's not physically there. Uh, I thought that was interesting. Do you, do you have anything to say about his historical uh, views on um, less uh, fossil fuel burning, less carbon, carbon uh, in China and moving? Uh, yes. Cleaner? Yes, I do. Okay. So... Uh, why he wants to do it, it's very simple. He wants to bring energy independence to China. So energy, uh, well, China is really large uh, energy dependent country. Mm. It will have to import coal and oil from other countries. So just take... Um, the recent uh, standoff with Australia, for, for example, they curbed the import uh, for Australian coal, right? They wanna give the Australian a lesson. <laughs> However, the domestic production was killed um, during 2014 and 2015 when they wanna go away from uh, producing coal within the chi China mainland uh, mm -hmm. to be more green, right? To be more green, to build more hydro dams, to, to build more solar farms, uh, to build more um, wind turbines, to renewables. However, <clears throat> they are not there yet. And the administration, the, the, the Chinese state, wants to uh, show the Australians, hey, don't side with Taiwan, right? Don't yeah. challenge our bottom line. <laughs> so they, they stopped importing uh, Australian coal. When there is still some inventory, they can get by. But however, uh, in the recent days, there is a lack of, lack of coal and coal prices skyrocketed. So that shows how energy dependent China is. And 
so she wants to bring energy in, in uh, independence to China. And I think being more green is just a uh, welcome uh, side effects of that. <laughs> To, to okay. use less fossil fuel to emit less, uh, you know, carbon. And, and they do have a, a, a jump start on a lot of others because they can, they, you know, the economy is top down directed. Uh, yeah. It, they have a, a huge jump on a lot of these cleaner energies. Uh, yeah, they do. They right? have yeah. solar farms, they have nuclear reactors. Yeah. And right. I think what the U.S. is doing wrong right now yeah. is not investing in nuclear power. Yeah. You know what? I, I, I did a podcast. Uh, I haven't released yet, so I don't know whether you get the blog or not. Judd, if you could send Michael that uh, the uh, book part, because we just had this discussion on uh, Tuesday. Well, he got it because he gets, he, gets, uh, he gets the research, so okay. it was in there. Yeah, so it's a it's a pretty in depth discussion on the nuclear. Say, you know, and Germany made a gigantic mistake. Uh, yep, yep. Uh, I mean, a terrible mistake. Yeah, and you know what? They don't have the the uh, you know the risks. Well, we all have risks with nuclear power, right? I don't care. You you uh, earthquakes, what, whatever we're going to find, there are some. But there's certainly you know Fukushima was just. Uh, First of all, that that tsunami was, uh, you know, you want to talk about. Uh, uh, I want to say no one can pre be pre prepared for that. Right, you can't. You know, you it, you know, and, and they build them. And Japanese engineering is cer is certainly at the highest levels in the world as German engineering. Now they've left. Everybody's kind of abandoned the nuclear. Uh, realm, of course, and we talk about that with, with France and, and China, and it's yeah. interesting that the UK, and this is a discussion that uh, Peter Buchmeier and I had the other day, that the UK actually becomes a battleground where you get to see this play out, because, uh, and, and what prompted that discussion, because on Monday, you know, the UK announced that they were pushing China out of the uh, nuclear uh, development in the UK, and uh, you know the French have always been there, and I think the Brits have erred badly in certain ways. And my point was with that is because EDF, the uh, huge French uh, nuclear uh, power uh, consortium, uh, the, the Brits could have financed the Hinkley Point and the Met and other nuclear uh, power uh, sources. All through, all through the ECB buying their bonds at ridiculously low levels and never having to worry about whether you were ever going to default or whether you were going to ever, uh, no pun intended, generate enough revenue to cover the cost of those bonds. It's, it's an easy fix, but they're pushing the Chinese out, but the Chinese will make their way to, of course, other places in Asia, because Asia will become, and probably Africa, by the way, uh, because nuclear power is going to be the answer to a lot of people's problems, uh, especially because you can build these small reactors, the pebble breeder reactors. I, I learned enough, a little enough about um, and follow this. In fact, I just, I, I just, my email just clicked, uh, my computer just clicked. I uh, subscribed to the uh, uh, Bulletin of Atomic Energy. So, you, you know, I get to stay on top of this. Yeah, I get a heads up, but uh, I think that's, those are really, really good points you make and things we have to pay attention to. Um, and China is a nuclear power in good ways and bad ways. You know, nuclear weapons, uh, well, philosophically, we could probably argue that uh, the existence of nuclear weapons has kept the world from having a, another major world conflagration. Um, Will it continue to do that for, for how long? Let, let's all hope so. Uh, but China is, was, is, and will be a, a nuclear force to deal with. And I don't mean that in just a nefarious uh, mechanism, by the way. It's, it's just checks and balances, you know. There's, yeah. well, <clears throat> we all know when there's, you know, war really comes, 
it will be all out. Nuclear, non-nuclear, doesn't matter, right? right? But for now, in the peaceful times, yeah, I, I'd agree that nuclear power is what keeps these wars at a smaller scale. <laughs> no, well, you know, it used to be that in, uh, in foreign policy circles, when I was a, uh, a fledgling in that area, you know, you would talk about proxy wars, right? Mm -hmm. the, so the Soviets and the Americans would both support uh, wars that were called proxy wars that they didn't have to get in, uh, uh, involved in, but they would, right. certainly, you know, they would arm the belligerents and let them, you know, and see which way, you know, kind of like going back to the Spanish Civil War of 1936, where uh, everybody tested out their weapons for what was going to be coming. Um, I, I don't think it was that nefarious, but rather than uh, than go at each other, you you sponsored other activity and you stayed out of everybody, you stayed out of each other's spheres of influence, right? So mm -hmm. when, when the Soviets went into Hungary, when they went into Czechoslovakia, you got a lot of words, but no action. So yeah. uh, are we going to do that? I, I will say, and I caution people to understand this, that when China does something in a militaristic way, we can learn from this, by the way, because they do it on the cheap. You know, and I always point to what took place in 1979 when China went in and wanted to bloody Vietnam for they were getting too close to the Soviets and the Chinese were starting to feel threatened and encircled by the Soviets. And they went into Vietnam for three weeks and beat the shit out of them. And then they said, okay, you get the message? And that was it. There was no 20 year Afghanistan. Right, that's right? the main point of this. They wanted to show a force Right. You acknowledge it, yep. and we're done. Exactly. I don't want to obliterate ob ob you, right? right? I don't want to destroy your country. I don't want you to be under my reign, but you just don't mess with us. That's it, it, the message we need to send. And I, and I think you have to look for because I think China is still, so if they go anywhere, they go short, they go fast and go, you get the message? Okay, because they're not looking. They... They've looked at history. It's almost like the Dutch in the West. You know, the Dutch gave up empire because they said, this is ridiculously expensive and we're never going to do it well. We're not a land force. Yeah, we could be a, 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 like the Brits, a naval force, but it's expensive. We can make a shitload more money just financing this whole thing around the world. Yeah. And that's what the Dutch did. They said, this, this is for lunatics. You know, we don't have to do this. So, uh, well, I always love talking to you because we get to go places. Let's do this more. I know you've had issues. I've had some issues. So I've been not writing as much. Listen to the book bar uh, podcast I did the other day with him and our discussion okay. of nuclear energy because I want to hear more from you about that. Maybe we can pick this up. You guys can keep talking. I just have to, some stuff I have to do. Michael, it's always a pleasure. Uh, Swiss Yen, Ira, take a look at it. I'm looking. I'm, okay. I believe I, <laughs> and I can't look at the euro. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, mean, it, <laughs> I mean, that's that's a substantial move. And this is all after Lagarde. And if you ask me about Lagarde's press conference, she uses phrase. She said, because somebody asked her, well, you know, other countries, and it was a good question. Um, other countries are starting to move off quantitative easing and away from it. And is this going to have any impact? And she's and she used this line: comparisons with other economies is odious. Oh, geez. that's a very strong phrase. And yet, I'm I'm sitting here watching, and this euro is on a tear here. Now, this now it may be. And nobody could could get it out of her like back in July where she she kept her composure very well. But was this ECB meeting full of uh, contentiousness? We don't know that. But somebody has seen something here. Now, now I think if you see, if you're watching the euro yen move, but interest rates have backed up quite a bit today. You know they've been all over the board. 
they've been all over the board. Uh, as soon as her press conference was over, the Bund actually, as I, I think I started, the Bund rallied 130 ticks. Uh, it's been all over. That was all, and you were totally right. That, that was just all intervention, and then it came right back down. And it, Right, and here we are. We're sitting kind of middle range. I've actually been, been using it for all those who, I don't know who has access to trade this, but the European, I, I've really done very well in European uh, debt markets. And I told you about the, uh, the two-year yesterday. Yeah. You know, I was, so I was getting short at uh, uh, 111, uh, 112, 10 and a half, 11, 11 and a half. I, I, and I've been able to make the trade three times today. I'm out, I'm out of the short end right now. I'm waiting to see if it'll rally back. But uh, we went all the way down to 111.94. So the, I, there's a lot of... Uh, well, you're the only guy on the planet who can trade that stuff anyways. I don't know. <laughs> no, Jesus. Not true. <laughs> not true. The volumes, the volumes are growing. And I'll tell you something else you know, <laughs> for stock traders. You see where the CME stock is at? Yeah, and there was a there was a huge there was a big article about ten thousand new uh, 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 um, micro oil traders. Oh, but but I'll tell you what I, I watch. I get the volume numbers every day, and they're available. I'm not. This is nothing inside. It's it's one of the great things about the CME stock from day one is that it would make it a really good trader if you watch volume <laughs> because revenue is you know, all volume driven i mean there are some ancillary but it's so it's so prominent to it but as bond trading has picked up i would probably say average daily volume has increased by 25 percent, and this is not at a rollover so like yesterday's volume 24 million uh yeah. probably this whole week we've been in the end of the previous week as as bond volumes picked up so I mean, for CME stock traders, those who I, I literally scalp it or trade it in a day, it is something to watch if you want, because I want to see if we take out the, it's all time high, I think it was up by 230. And this is not, believe me, I'm not on the board. I have no standing anywhere, um, but, I do, but I do get the volume numbers uh, directly as anybody can. Uh, so that, it is just so interesting to see when you start to get bond volatility, how volume increases so dramatically. All right, so, you know, Porter just jumped back on. Back yeah, yeah. What, uh, Porter, why don't you unmute yourself? Do you have any uh, questions for Michael or Ira or any comments about the conversation so far? <laughs> uh, well, it's interesting, but you you guys are, are uh, much more, uh, much, much more intelligent and much more informed <laughs> than I am. <laughs> Come I, I, on. Stop I'm, it. We're still I'm living a, in an acid flashback. You wrote about it. Yeah, that's right. I'm 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 a big picture guy, and big pictures are very easy to draw. It's when you get down to the little pictures with the details and the fine lines that it causes a lot of problems. But I I'm I'm uh, basically a a advocate of competitive cooperation cooperation with uh, between the US and China uh, we can tank them anytime we want by just stopping the US exports that are propping up the Chinese economy right now that's not going to happen but I you know today's headlines uh, in the journal are the the uh, general Milley's uh, concern about the hypersonic missiles that China has developed uh, yeah. they're ne they're never going to use them because we we can also have hypersonic missiles if if we needed it, but we're not spending billions of dollars. What Millie was really doing was pitching to Congress, saying you're shortchanging the Defense Department on the, the budget arguments that are going on right now in Congress, uh, and put some more money into the military. The the interesting thing right now is where. President Xi in China stands on environmentalism because that, that's really the, the, the weak link in the Chinese economy. Uh, on the one hand, they're trying to pretend that they're staying along with the promise of zero carbon emissions by 2050. And at the same time, they're the biggest consumers of coal and, and other carbon producers in the world and they're they're 
increasing their carbonization more than cutting back. So it's 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 going to catch up with Beijing at some point very soon. Um, how does that impact the stocks? Well, the two things that I think are the most significant developments in the last 12 months are A, BlackRock was given a 100% ownership right to set up uh, investment and, and, and advisory services in China. They've been there for 10 years, but they've always had to have a, a joint venture partner. The same thing happened to Goldman Sachs last week. They got 100% got rid of their JV partner, which was a state-owned bank. Uh, I've got an, another call. I'm going to jump back in and talk to you guys later. Sorry. Wait, I, I, what, Porter, I have one quick question for you, though. Oh, he's gone. Okay. He's gone. What was the question? I'll ask him and I'll record it when he comes back. I, I wanted to know his views on the Rolling Stones stopping the singing Brown Sugar. Oh, okay. Well, that's why I was, <laughs> was a former but editor he, of the Rolling Stones. You ought to know. Uh, so, uh, but he went right where, you know, the conversation with Mike, and that was great because Mike's views, you know. But but I, it's interesting that he went there too because I would tell him, and he should read uh, Ambrose Evans Pritchard's piece uh, from yesterday on G's history. And interesting that Mike picked up right on that too. So uh, I had never heard that, but it was Ambrose Evans Pritchard really really cuts into some ground all the time. That's why he's, you know, I know. Uh, because he writes for the Telegraph. If you talk to people in Britain, oh, you should wrong. Read it before you, you know, just because somebody pays him more doesn't mean uh, he has any less credibility. Sorry, you know. Yeah. Hey, so I wanted to roll back to nuclear power a sec, Michael. It seems like you follow that pretty closely. You still there? Uh, yeah, I'm here. So, so, uh, um, is I've been following nuclear a long time and I've been following this idea of modular reactors or maybe thorium nuclear power or, or you know, third, fourth generation nuclear power plants. And I, I, I just thought, I thought it's been really interesting for a long time. Uh, apparently politically not palatable, but a uh, uh, place like China, it is now it is politically palatable because it, like I agree uh, they they need electricity and they need clean electricity. If for no other reason, they they need to lessen their imports, dependence on imports of carbon fuels, and also the air pollution is so bad in in their major cities, and the, you know the the party bosses can't escape that themselves. So do you, do you see them uh, securing the, their uranium supplies? Do they have their own uranium supplies? And also, do you know much about uh, their progress into, uh, you know, uh, progressive uh, future, uh, uh, you know, technology and nuclear energy? Well, I, uh, I have not looked at where China gets its uraniums from, but yeah. I would assume uh, uh, much majority of them is from Australia. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, good. In Kazakhstan yeah. has it. Maybe they can buy it from them. Yeah, it's Australia, and then I do know a few um, uranium mines in China, but those are low grade uranium. Are, those are not very rich, are, so they have to they? spend a lot of money to uh, enrich the, the uranium to make them out of you know the the fuel rods for uh, the nuclear reactors. Are are those in Xinjiang also? Because so much of that of the rare. Uh, well, I um, uh, no, actually, they are um, um, in the inner Mongolia region. Oh, oh, that's right. That's right. Huge. That's right. I just read about those. But they they can also buy from Canada too. By the way. Now that they well, yeah, if Canada's willing to sell, of course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but now, and now that they've resolved the issue with uh, uh, Meng, Meng Wanzhou, the, the, yeah. the Huawei CFO, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's that's well, another a, that's another well, weak response, uh, for the US side. Oh, god, yes, I, 
Pathetic, by the way. Pathetic. Yeah, this is word, know, word. The Chinese just played tit for tat, and then of course they release us to uh, business. What what should we call those Canadians who are being held business people? Expats. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. But you know what? You also bring up something interesting, or or um, Porter did with the uh, suit with the hypersonic uh, weaponry. Oh yeah, I think General Milley brings it up because he yeah. wants to um, uh, how do we say upgrade the 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 uh, the NORAD. Uh, yeah. yeah, he he wants more. Um, um, Money, yeah, to, to upgrade yeah, the, really uh, the anti-missile system. Because we all know uh, Chinese technology, the, the missile technology is not that advanced yet. Yeah, They cannot hit the U US. But you know what, again, and then, then it makes, because global politics then just becomes that much more complicated. Because the Indians, uh, Indian scientists and engineers, have been very good at uh, missile technology. Uh, and the Indians are not uh, dependent upon US. You know, the Indians crafted their own way uh, back in the 60s when you go back to uh, Suhardo's uh, third way with the uh, independence, which China certainly exploited uh, to their benefit with being in the non aligned camp. So, there's a lot of technology that's available to the Chinese. And, and I, I have discussions with people who go, well, you know, when you clamp down too hard on Israel, Israel technology is pretty good and the Chinese are salivating to buy that technology. Oh yeah. Salivating. I mean, they want that technology and of course they can't get at it in the current situation, but people who are so quick to go, well, do this, do that. Be a little careful here. And there's nothing wrong with R Russian technology, as we know. So there's a lot of these technologies that are easily viable in the world and easily attainable. So the, that, that part, and I, Porter was on, that grip that the United States used to have on choking everybody, not so. And I think one of the biggest things going on right now is the pushback against, like uh, when Mnuchin was in, but he's not the only one. It went back to the Obama group uh, This and Bush. So we've had 20 years of sanctions. You know, sanction, everything's a sanction. Well, we're gonna say- and, and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And actually, as I said yesterday, there is that splendid piece in Project Syndicate by uh, Robert Skidelsky, who I, who I do respect, He's a very good independent voice, Lord Sadowski, uh, talking about that sanctions just don't work and why do they keep going this route? And you're going to, and, and, and as, as, as Mike just talked about, the United States, it's like with the Canadian thing, comes up way short, way short, because um, they just get on the wrong side of things. And when you have to backtrack here, and, and, I, and I really, I find it, uh, to say the least, so audacious that that Biden basically begs uh, Russia and the and the Saudis for oil when you're busy slapping them each and every way. What you know? What are you doing? You can, you can't be going hat in hand and begging uh, when when <laughs> when, you, when you're you're busy. Uh, maligning and upbraiding and whatever else words, we, you know, you, you got to be a little quiet, a lot quieter in the way that you approach it. You know, if you got soft power to, to wield, wield it softly. Don't be just standing up there and screaming at everybody and telling them, well, you're violating this. We're going to come back at you with this or that. It, it's the world is just so complicated. And, you know, it's always the knee jerk reaction. I, I'm I'm continually amazed at that. Well, I guess what's happening is the U.S. wants to be as vocal as the Chinese nowadays because the Chinese are very vocal about uh, global 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 politics 
<clears throat> in the UN, in, in the Pacific region, right. even in the uh, African uh, continent. Mm -hmm. So US wants to, I guess, but Biden administration, as well as Trump administration, wants to be as vocal uh, as the Chinese. They don't necessarily know what they want, but they just know they have to be loud to be heard. Yes, that's a great way to put it. I, that's a great way to put it. And I, yeah, the Chinese with the wolf warriors, you know, out of the uh, yep. all their embassies. And I think they realized that that was not a really good policy. You know, they went on the attack, but. No, it's not. How, look how they did, what they did to uh, Australia. Right. right? Right, right, right. They're and not I buying coal from Australians. Okay, Australians sell them to Indonesians, sell them to Malaysians, and the Malaysians and the Indonesians sells those coals to China. <laughs> you know what? And Kevin Rudd has been one of the better voices of reasonableness in the world. You know, because he, I know he's, he, you know, he's fluent in Mandarin, and he understands, and and. You, you undermine his credibility, which doesn't serve you well. I'm talking about with, with, when the Chinese went on the, you, all you did was undermine Kevin Rudd. I mean, not that he has official standing, except that he was an Australian prime minister and, it, and is well regarded when it comes to uh, his views on China. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm gonna, uh, I'm going to mute myself. Uh, if I hear anything interesting, I'll jump in. But Michael, really, it's great to hear from you, talk to you. I'm glad you're well, and uh, thanks for taking the time and uh, look to hear more from you. Thanks. Goes both ways. Thanks, yeah, Adam. Yeah. Thanks, 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 Michael. I mean, if you want to jump off and go to your day, <clears throat> fine. You want to stick around? Anybody has any other questions? Great. Um, but it's always great to catch up with you. Okay, I'll keep listening, but I will mail myself. Uh, I'll type my uh, replies uh, if any questions come up. Okay, Hi. and I'm gonna pause the recording, guys. Thanks a lot, Michael. Good catching up with you. Hi.